Greetings and salutations. I want to apologize for not having the most exciting or best case post bomb rust cyberfunk, but I am extremely exhausted from working on that and I am working on another big case for y'all. So in the meantime, we're going to solve something a little easier this Friday. I love competitive games and I love to compete. It comes from my athletic and sports background. I love fighting games and I've been playing a plethora of different kinds of fighting games my entire life. Though I admit, I haven't gotten to anything super competitive since really Rivals of Aether dropped on Switch. That's been really fun, but my name is Detective Hemmings, codename Paperwork. I am the literary detective. Welcome to K17. Do tier lists actually matter in fighting games? For any game played competitively, there are tier lists. That doesn't only apply to fighting games. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe has a specific weight, car and wheel combination, plus the glider. That's probably considered to be amongst the best or the best combination. Shooting games tend to have gears and guns and weapon customizations that are considered to be better than others. Or some games end up becoming competitive that weren't meant to be due to grassroots communities pushing the game or an aspect of that game to that place. Some games you might not think are competitive like Lethal League Blaze, Mario Tennis Aces, or the Mega Man Battle Network games. They all have a competitive scene. But for this video, for this case, we're going to focus on fighting game tier lists specifically. For those who don't know, a tier list is essentially a list in a fighting game that lists the best characters to the worst characters. Assuming the players are at the same level of skill, the player that chose the better character on the tier list should have a major advantage. Professional gamers for fighting games establish the meta game for fighters and generally get a sense of which characters are the best. Then, from there, certain characters become viable and most competitive players start using the best characters in the game because it gives them the greatest chance of victory. Let's dive into it a bit more, but please like the video, subscribe, and hit the bell or else I will slap your last slice of pizza out your hand onto the goddamn ground. There's always controversy surrounding tier lists because some people believe in tier lists and some people do not. Common arguments used for those who don't think tier lists are really sensible say that the game comes down to mind games and skill, technique. The better player can win with any character. If you're good enough, ideally, you could use the game's worst character and beat the game's best character. This isn't completely false, but the player with the worst character has to work that much harder to win. In any competitive fighting game, once a meta is established, that's primarily all you will see. The same high tier characters versus other high tier characters. The same weapon loadouts against the same weapon loadouts. Another reason this happens is because everyone starts playing the same characters and discovering new tricks and techniques with them no one really does that for the bad characters. Once the idea that certain characters are bad are implanted into a player's head, they're that much less likely to give them a chance. Competitive players play for money and glory and some for a living so they don't have time to waste with low tiers. But an argument you might hear is some low tiers might have techniques or abilities or things about them that are so special and unique, but because no one attempts to use them, you'll never know. The thing that makes certain characters top tier are usually characters that are created with tools to effectively neutralize or deal with every situation, or at the very least, that character wins the most amount of matchups in the entire game in comparison to you know a next uh, lower tier or second place for example Sheik in super smash brothers 4 for the wii u can deal with pretty much any type of character fast powerful zoning before the nerf by the way she had a great neutral game and can essentially play lag free Sheik racks up damage quickly has a good recovery and can gimp a lot of characters off stage for a long time in melee marth fox Falco dominated the scene and the last time I checked for ultimate I'm pretty sure it was Joker and the Aegis, Pyro and Mithra. 
Superman in the Justice 1 also pretty much had everything, an air dash, great anti-hair, good projectiles, mobility, and even awesome damage output. Kratos in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Yeah, I'm using some obscure ass games. You guys are like, what the, why is he using these games? Because I want to. Kratos in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale had a physical counter, one for projectiles, the ability to build AP quickly, and great combos, making him the best character in the game. As you can see, all these characters were given way too much to make them balance. But is that a bad thing? I don't think so necessarily. One of the cool things about fighting games is coming up with strategies and techniques in order to beat top tiers. And if you beat a top tier character with a lower tier one, the victory is that much sweeter and that much better. Are low tier characters unusable? The advantages that come with a completely underused character is the element of surprise, the art of the unknown. Assuming you mastered some unknown tech and skill with said character, you could completely put an opponent in situations they are completely unaccustomed to dealing with. It's called not knowing the matchup. Way back in the day at a Mortal Kombat X tournament, I was able to get decently far in bracket for a game I didn't own due to people being very unaccustomed to fighting Cassie Cage, the Hollywood and Brawler variation. There's nothing wrong with maining a character that's not top tier as long as you put the work in to make your character the biggest threat they can be. You gotta lock in, brothers and sisters. A lot of characters that are high tier have steep learning curves while others are pick up and play types. For example, Mitsuru Kirijo from Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. She's so good, but very hard to use for newcomers and people not accustomed to fighting games like that. Charge characters really throw people off, especially new people. I think it's fair for a character to be really good if mastering them takes a lot of time and practice and the execution level of these combos are high. Sometimes, unfortunately, a character is high tier and brain dead and pretty easy to pick up. I'd argue in the early stages of Super Smash Bros. 4 for the Wii U, Diddy Kong with his hoo-ha was brain dead easy. Ultimately, I think you should play a fighting game the way that is the most fun to you. I don't like using characters I don't like, whether they're low, mid, or top tier. I pick characters I like, master them, try to win matches in the style that I like to win. Whether you adhere to tier list and play with the best characters or don't, doesn't matter. Just play to win, have as much fun as humanly possible, and don't overthink it. Nothing will trump practice, skills, mental fortitude, and the willpower to dominate is what I say. But to answer the question, do they matter? They absolutely do, especially at the highest levels of competition, but that doesn't mean you must adhere to it. It's not like it's the law. You get me? And with that, we got a pretty small yet mediocre case out the way. I know this wasn't super long and in-depth, but I got greatness in store for y'all. So stay tuned and stay locked in, I promise. Consider this case over and done with. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. And stay safe, everybody. Detective Hemmings, signing out.